Good morning to everyone. Uh, we are now moving forward with our next topic, um, the transfer of players from a national and international point of view, also with the difference uh, with the MLS system. Uh, and I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Miss Desire Ornella Desire Belia. Uh, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to have you here. It's going to be a very interesting uh, topic. Uh, Ornella is the current head of the legal affairs uh, for the European leagues in Neon in Switzerland since 2015. She also she is also a judge for the player status subcommittee of FIFA, where she is also in charge of the approval of decisions for the international transfer of minors since uh, February 2017. And uh, well, she also most of you already know her. She also serves as a uh, of counsel for. Uh, prestigious law firms in Brazil, in England, and also in Spain. Uh, she was also working as head of the legal affairs for Calcio Catania in Italy. And she is also a uh, guest professor usually for most of the prestigious programs on football management and law in ISDE, uh, UEFA, La Liga Business School. So Ornella, thank you very much for being with us and please the floor is yours. First of all, thank you very much for uh, your presentation. Thank you for uh, being here and for uh, the World Football Summit for inviting me. It's uh, really a great pleasure to be here in Madrid at this uh, fantastic event. So I would like also to thank um, San Ferrero Law Firm because of they proposed also my name for, for this speech. So thank you to, to all of you. And it's a crucial time to speak about uh, this uh, fascinating topic, international national transfer of players, because actually at the time being, uh, FIFA is performing an overall analysis, and an overall uh, revision of the football transfer system. So you might have seen that uh, uh, um, exactly, FIFA is, uh, is thinking to revise some of the, the rules uh, that are currently in place since 2001 um, according to the FIFA regulation on the status and transfer of players. Um, so, uh, based on that, since uh, uh, things can change in uh, the near future, I've structured my presentation in a way that before going into details, uh, going through the main legal issues, the main key uh, points of international transfer of players with a comparison with the national systems. Um, we go through uh, the main um, economic uh, aspects also of international transfer to understand better why FIFA is uh, uh, proposing these, uh, this change to the system. So we will have a very brief um, overview of some economic and uh, political implication. So as I, as I said before, uh, the current rules entered into force in 2001 after the Bosman case uh, when FIFA was somehow obliged by the European Commission to revise the previous system and to enter into negotiation with the European Commission and with the other football stakeholders to set up a new, a new system. So since that time, uh, nothing has changed more or less. But meanwhile, of course, football has changed a lot. And we, we of course know that the increase of football has been dramatic. The increase also of the uh, football transaction has been uh, fantastic, has been great. And the product, the football product, has, um, has increased due to the, um, to the growth in value of the broadcasting rights. So of course there is an injection of money nowadays that was not uh, uh, foreseen before. So over the last few years we have uh, witnessed a lot of uh, very expensive international transfer. Uh, it started with Bale some years ago, then we saw Pogba moving from um, uh, Juventus to Manchester United. And last year, last summer, we saw also another big transfer that was quite uh, uh, popular because uh, um, the amount of 222 million were paid by PSG to, to Barcelona. Actually, it was not a transfer. Technically, it was the execution of a buyout clause, and we will talk about it later. Later on, we have some slides on it, uh, but actually this was quite a wake-up uh, wake call for the football industry because everybody realized that perhaps there is an inflation in the transfer system and something has to be done. So just for, for um, to have some 
figures, the number of transfers has dramatically increased. In 2017, we have, we have seen more than 15,000 international transfers. And um, global spending has increased dramatically. For example, just last year, a total of 6.2 billion, 3 billion were, were spent on in international transfer market. So, and in particular, it's the European market uh, the richest market uh, in football that is uh, spending uh, a lot of uh, money in, um, in, uh, in transfer fees. So actually the five top leagues, the Premier League, the La Bundesliga, La Liga, Italian Serie A, and League One spend three times more than all the rest of the world combined. Um, so some interesting figures regards also intermediaries because, for example, we have seen that recently the amount paid uh, for commission to agents to intermediaries has dramatically uh, increased with last year, 2017, reaching an amount uh, of 447 million where uh, out of this amount, just 125 million were paid just by uh, Premier League clubs. <coughs> so we said that Based on all these um, findings, uh, on, on all these um, facts and figures, FIFA decided in 2016, but especially after the Neymar case, uh, to, to have a look at the system, how it works, what are the uh, current trends, and to, um, to, to set the task force first within the uh, Football Stakeholders Committee, that is the, foot, the, the committee where uh, the football stakeholders meet to discuss these kind of topics, change to the regulation, and then they decide to set up a task force to propose some uh, new uh, new rules. So actually yesterday there was another meeting of the football stakeholders uh, committee at FIFA and uh, the task force presented the result of their analysis of the system. So basically um, FIFA shared um, a white paper on transfer some months ago, or one month and a half uh, ago, uh, with all the stakeholders, also the leagues, we received this, um, this document from FIFA. And the main findings of this document were that the market is driven by speculation, not by solidarity, how, how it was supposed to be when the rules were established in 2001, following the informal agreement with the European Commission. Then that there is an abuse of the loan system, there is an inflation, of course, also the transfer system, and there is lack of transparency. So based on these uh, main findings, uh, there are some measures that have been pro um, proposed by uh, the task force to the football stakeholders committee. And these measures for now are uh, just these, uh, these four. First of all, a clearing house. The clearing house will be um, uh, the way in uh, all the football related payment will be made. This means, for example, payment related to transfer fees between two clubs, payment related to solidarity payment train compensation, but also payment to uh, intermediaries. So every big will be everything will be controlled. Will be uh, there will be much more transparency uh, than now. Uh, there will be limits also on loans because, as I said before, FIFA think that there is an abuse of the loan system with a lot of clubs having players, 50 players on loan somewhere else in Europe. So uh, there will there will be law, um, uh, not only limits on the number of loans, but also, for example, the idea is to uh, to ban bridge transfer and not only the the bridge transfer as we are uh, used to, uh, to, um, uh, to to know them, but also, for example, I mean those transfer where a club acquire the services of a player on a transparent uh, basis and then sell um, send the, the, the player on loan to another club in the same transfer window. So it's likely that this will not, will not be possible anymore if this uh, uh, set of uh, rules, of new rules, will be implemented. Then there will be also new rules for intermediaries. In my opinion, this is one uh, of the most important um, uh, amendments that we will uh, 
be made because as you might know in 2014 uh, the rules on intermediaries have changed so now there is no more a licensing system but it seems that with the new regulation that FIFA is currently dra drafting, uh, intermediaries will be again subject to a licensing system, to uh, some very strict rules, especially in, um, in relation to the, the commission, because there will be uh, mandatory uh, caps on their commission. The, pay the payment of this commission will be made through the clearing house. Then if the intermediary, for example, uh, has worked with a club for a, 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 a football transaction, then the same intermediary cannot be paid by the club for other activities, like, for example, for scouting or for marketing activities. Mm -hmm. So this is quite a big, um, a big news. And then also for lawyers, um, it's likely that it's going to be uh, mandatory to, um, uh, to be subject to the licensing uh, process because uh, the, the rules will be extended also to lawyers. These are some of the proposals that are included in this, uh, um, this package, but it's not, uh, of course, sure that all these proposals will then be translated into, uh, new, new, in the, into the, the new regulation. And then there will be... Um, also new rules on training compensation and solidarity payments. Uh, actually, there are for now two models that are being discussed at FIFA. One is uh, the um, elimination of training compensation and an increase on the percentage of the solidarity mechanism. The other system see both the, the, clear, the, the solidarity and training comp compensation in place, but with a different uh, calculation of the amount when it comes to training compensation. So these are uh, more or less uh, the findings of this uh, white paper uh, that are, it's almost public so mm, perhaps there is nothing new for some of you. Um, I try to, to make this presentation very simple because I know that this is not a legal event. The World Football Summit is also uh, focused on commercial and other uh, size of the, the industry so I imagine that many of you are not lawyers, so I try to keep it very, very simple so also newcomers can, can simply understand. So, and I have divided this, um, this section into five uh, steps of the transaction, of the football uh, transaction, the football deal, uh, because these are the main five uh, steps where the major legal uh, issue can, uh, can arise. So negotiation agreement, uh, FIFA DMS, and release of the ITC, and registration. Of course, uh, we are referring to international, um, international transfers in this case, because it's only when there is an international transfer, and a transfer with an, an international dimension, that the, um, uh, it's required the issue of uh, the IDC International Transfer Certificate. When it comes, of course, to national transfer, the IDC has not to be released, so it's not required. And um, so the registration is done through the, the national association or, to, uh, or uh, through the league, so it depends uh, country by country there might be different rules. So everything uh, starts with the negotiation before a deal is made. Uh, it's always the same story. The club is interested in a player, so I enter in contact with the player, then with the club. According to, to FIFA regulation and to Article 18.3 of FIFA regulation, when a, play, uh, a club is interested in a player, uh, has to send um, a notice in writing, uh, has to inform the other club that is entering into negotiation with the other with, with the player. Usually, since the football is a small world, usually you <laughs> just uh, make a phone call. I don't know if a player, uh, if Valencia is interested in a player of Real Madrid, uh, uh, Matteo Alemani will call uh, Florentino Perez, just uh, informing him that he's interested in the players. But according to FIFA regulation, of course, if in case the, the club is not informed in writing, sanction might be applied. I, I've never seen sanction for this case, to be honest. Actually, I've never seen a club sending uh, an email <laughs> just to inform the other <laughs> club. Uh, uh, actually, yeah, just once 
I was involved in the negotiation of um, uh, Jovinko when he moved to, to Toronto and Toronto said no, we have to write a formal email to Juventus because it's written in the FIFA regulation. So they did it and actually was not the case because uh, Jovinko was already in the sixth last month of his contract, so was not needed because, as you know, uh, the, in the last six months of the contract, the player is free, as he said also by Article 18.4, uh, the, the player is uh, free to, to enter into negotiation with other clubs because, of course, after the expiration of the contract, it will be a free agent, it will be out of contract and no transfer fee has to be uh, paid to the former club. And this is a result of the Bosman case, as we all know. Uh, so, of course, uh, this trans uh, transaction can be done only during the transfer window. Of course, the negotiation may start before the opening of the transfer window, but players can be registered with a new club only when the transfer window, the registration period, is open. This means, of course, for, uh, for Europe, we know we have two transfer windows. One is in summer, the first one is a long one, 12 weeks, and the, the, the second one is in, um, in January, in, uh, in winter. But, of course, in other countries, uh, these, um, the seasons are overlapping, so there, there are different uh, transfer windows. Um, then there are some exceptions, for example, because uh, players who are out of contract because they have terminated their contract before the expiration of, uh, uh, before the close of the uh, of the transfer window, they are um, entitled to be registered even outside uh, the registration period. But there are also some de deadlines that may apply at national level. For example, in Italy, not all the free agents. Uh, can be uh, registered out of the, the registration period because there is a time limit of the 31st of, of March. So after that day, even if the player is a free agent, it cannot be registered anymore. Uh, then there are some exceptions also to, um, to the, the transfer window rules because, for example, in, uh, in, um, in the Premier in uh, sorry, in the um, English football leagues this year, um, it was possible to register uh, players on loan also after the, the close of the transfer window. Uh, uh, premise first because it uh, might be needed. So as you know, this summer the Premier League, uh, the second division of uh, England, so the European football leagues and also Serie A, closed their transfer window earlier, before the, clo the, um, the start of the season. So actually for, uh, European, uh, for uh, English football clubs it was possible to, um, to register players on loans but um, in the independently or if it was uh, from an international club or from national club also outside the, uh, the, the transfer window. And then there is also another rule in um, establishing uh, Spain in the regulation of the um, football federation uh, in which, for example, a player, in case a club suffer, uh, a player suffer from a long-term injury that is at least five months, then the, play, the, the club is entitled to register a, a player, a new player, even though the transfer window is, uh, is closed. So, um, <coughs> The next step is, of course, uh, the, the agreement. During the negotiation, the, 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 the clubs and the, uh, the, the players start uh, also discussing the terms of the contract. So it's uh, uh, always the same story. You send the contract, then there are some amendments, and then it's uh, a never-ending story since the very last uh, minute of the deadline day sometimes. Uh, what is important at this uh, stage is uh, to consider, to be reminded that medical examination must be done before the employment contract is signed between the player and the, and the, the club. Because according to FIFA regulation, the, con the employment contract cannot be made um, conditional uh, uh, to the successful uh, medical examination. This means that, for example, if the player doesn't pass the medical examination and the contract is already signed, the club is obliged to pay the salary and is obliged to integrate the player uh, in, uh, in the squad. 
I cannot say, okay, but you didn't pass the examination and there was a clause in the contract saying that in case the contract was not valid because uh, FIFA wants the clubs to be diligent and to do, um, of course, all the necessary uh, consideration before a contract is, um, is uh, uh, signed. Uh, these provisions concern also work permit and concern only employment contracts. So this doesn't mean that uh, this kind of clause uh, cannot be uh, included, for example, in a transfer agreement. In transfer agreement, these clauses are um, are possible, are, re are not prohibited. Uh, there was, I remember a case, I think it was between uh, Lazio and Villarreal, some years ago, there was a loan agreement between uh, Lazio and Villarreal. So uh, the player was transferred in, on loan to, to Lazio. Lazio was supposed to pay a certain uh, loan fee, but then the player didn't pass the examination. There was a clause in the loan agreement saying that in case the player was not uh, uh, success, um, the, the medical examination was not successful, the contract was not valid. So Lazio said, uh, VR, Lazio said, okay, the contract is not valid, and VRL said, no, it's valid because actually the loan agreement was also co-signed by the player. So actually, CAS in that case said the fact that the the, the player co-signed a transfer agreement or lo a loan agreement doesn't change the nature of a transfer or loan agreement because of course there is another agreement that is an employment agreement that is the one that is uh, the, the one that matters in terms of com uh, of employment related matters um, so now uh, we go through uh, the main clauses that are included in a transfer contract, and then we will see also in our um, employment contract, in a loan contract, but it's just to have an overview of what, what are the main clauses and the main legal issues that are uh, related to, to these clauses. So when it comes to the transfer agreement, of course, there is always uh, a clause concerning the amount to be paid for the transfer. Of course, the transfer can be also on a free basis. So this means that there is no transfer fee to be paid. But usually, if there is a, a transfer fee is uh, written in the transfer agreement and the installments are established, the deadline for the payment, so on, there can be also some bonuses related uh, also to the uh, to this transfer. A very uh, common clause is the sell-on clause. We will see later in a, a separate slide uh, what does it mean and what condition trigger the uh, execution of a sell-on clause. There might be uh, provision on training compensation and solidarity mechanism, but usually is not needed because there is a, uh, there are clear re uh, rules in FIFA regulation. Of course, the arbitration clause and so on. When it comes to uh, new uh, the new employment agreement between the player and his, uh, and his uh, new club, of course, uh, the remuneration of the player, if there are bonuses, usually there are bonuses related to the number of goals, to the number of matches played, to the uh, possible qualification in uh, Europa League or Champions League, win, uh, or to the um, two titles, for example, uh, national or international titles, and so on. Some very uh, important uh, clauses in this kind of contract are the buyout clause, which is very popular, very common in uh, Spain, also because established in the CBA, uh, release clause and indemnification clause that are similar clause, but of course have a different nature, although the results sometimes might be the same. And then there is usually an image rights uh, clause, but for some players, the image rights uh, can be uh, regulated by a separate agreement. For some top players, usually there is a separate agreement, rights agreement between the club and an image rights company. In some countries, uh, there are uh, image rights contracts are used uh, for, of course, different reasons also. Uh, for example, 
countries like U Ukraine, uh, there are uh, the clubs are used to propose to players, to coach two different contracts. The employment contract, where there is a very low amount uh, for for the salary, and the salary this low amount is paid by by the club. And then an, another another contract that is the image rights contract with. The, the more significant part of the remuneration, but is uh, with an, another company, which is not, of course, uh, the club. And this is not um, advisable, of course, for football players and for coaches to enter this in, uh, into this kind uh, of agreement. It's better sometimes not to even to, to, to move to uh, proposing this kind of uh, structure in the agreement, because then uh, the, the, the situation can, uh, can raise some, uh, uh, some concerns, some legal, legal problems, and FIFA is not competent to, to, uh, to deal with uh, image rights company with third parties. So this is important to bear in mind when drafting this kind of contract. And then uh, when it comes to the, um, to the new employment uh, contract of the player with the club, an interesting uh, aspect is the percentage of, on the future transfer fee uh, if the player is, for example, sold uh, later on after some years to another club. Because actually, as you might be aware, uh, for sure my, my, my colleagues, uh, some uh, that are here, are very aware and they know even better than me the topic, but for, for all the others that might be not uh, very familiar with this topic, in 2014 FIFA has banned the TPO, the third party um, ownership on uh, economic rights of players. This means that third parties, uh, investment funds, um, uh, intermediaries cannot uh, be entitled to uh, own any shares on the future transfer, on the future transfer fee of a player. So the, the question at that time was if a club is also considered a third party, so if the sell-on clause, that is the clause according to which uh, the club, the former club is entitled to receive a share of the future transfer fee of the player, was uh, uh, legitimate or not. So, but for sure, according to uh, the wording of FIFA regulation, uh, the players were to be considered considered third party, so we're not entitled to participate uh, in the future transfer, in the future transfer fee, in case of a future uh, transfer to another club. But actually, there are, there were, there are some uh, CBA at national level for a seeing also an obligation for uh, the club to pay a certain percentage to the player out of the transfer fee. So it was a kind of uncertain situation, but actually in uh, June 2018, so just a few months ago, the FIFA Disciplinary Committee has issued a very interesting decision saying that actually players are not to be considered third party, so they are entitled to receive a percentage over on the, trans on, the, on the future transfer fee, and this, is, this has to be considered as a part of the remuneration. So this means that this kind of clause might become very, uh, very common, also not only in Spain, but uh, in Portugal, but also in, uh, in other countries. Um, then when it comes to the employment contract, there are some provisions to, to bear in mind when entering into, in this, uh, into the, the employment contract. Uh, for example, when it comes to the minimum length of, of the contract, according to FIFA regulation, it must be um, between the effective date of the contract and the, um, the end of the season. So there is not a clear... Um, a clear uh, period, but this is um, what uh, is said in the FIFA regulation. But then there are at national level, for example, some different provisions. For example, in the Premier League, in the Re Premier League regulation handbook, uh, there is the possibility also to enter into employment contract just for one month, so monthly uh, co employment contract or week per week contract. So it might differ from country to, to country. Uh, then the maximum length of a contract, according to FIFA regulation, the maximum is uh, five years uh, and three years for minors. But for um, in many countries, the situation can be different. For example, in uh, Portugal, the maximum um, length of a contract is seven years. So then it, it depends, of course, country by, by country. 
Uh, as I said before, the medical examination and the work being permit cannot be a condition to the um, employment contract. And then the minimum age to enter into an employment contract because uh, basically 16 years uh, old, the minimum age. Uh, in, in Europe, more or less everywhere, uh, in, uh, in, the, in, in England, in the Premier League is uh, 17 because before the player can only enter into an academy uh, contract, not to an employment contract. So when drafting this contract, of course, you have to be reminded of FIFA regulation, but also national regulation that apply. So now we go into details of the, what of those clauses that we have seen before. Uh, when it comes to the buyout clause, uh, we said that this is quite uh, common, quite popular in uh, a new employment contract uh, between the club and the player, in, uh, especially in, uh, in Spain and in Portugal. In Spain is uh, also foreseen by the Real Decreto. So uh, while, for example, in other countries, like for example uh, in England, these kind of clauses are, uh, are not allowed. Um, so, what is a buyout clause? Actually, is a clause according which the player uh, and the club establish a certain amount in order for the player to uh, terminate his contract before the normal expiration of the contract. Usually, is the player the one who is entitled to pay himself out by paying uh, the amount. So, in case the new club will. Uh, uh, give the, me the financial means to the player in order for the player to deposit the, the check at La Liga, for example, like it was the case for, for Neymar. But in some other cases, we have seen also uh, clubs paying the amount directly. This may lead to some tax implication because, of course, in principle, it's more convenient to pay a transfer fee rather than uh, um, the, uh, a compensation, uh, um, a price for the execution of the buyout clause. Uh, and then there are also other implications when it comes to train compensation and solidarity mechanism, but we will see it later. <coughs> um, so there is a basically a difference between the buyout clause and other clauses, other, other penalty clause, like for example, the indemnity clause. The difference might be that while, for example, the price, the compensation that is uh, established in the buyout clause is just a price for the player to exercise his right to terminate earlier his, uh, his contract. In uh, the indemnification clause, the amount is uh, an amount established as damages for the early termination of the player. Basically, is the same, but the nature can uh, can be considered different. And then there is also the release uh, clause, which is a clause according which the the club agree that in the case the club receive an offer for a certain amount of money, then the pl the club is obliged to to sell the player. So it cannot retain the, the player. Um, another important and very common clause, as I said before, is the sell-on clause. This clause is um, included not in the, in the employment contract, but rather in the uh, transfer agreement. Is the clause according which a club who is selling the player retain a certain per percentage of the future transfer of um, of the player to a third club. So this means that when the new club sells the, the player for a third club and receive a certain amount of money, then has to pay a certain per percentage to the previous club. So as I said before, these clause uh, are not prohibited by FIFA regulation, even though third party have been uh, prohibit prohibited by FIFA. Uh, but the, the sell on clause gives rise to a number of um, legal issues, a number of disputes that is uh, worth all, um, always to, um, to draft these clauses in a very, very uh, careful way and by uh, making by explaining all the details of the condition that trigger uh, the buyout, the, the sell on close. For example, in case there is a transfer, uh, a sell on close in a, in a transfer agreement, and, and it said that, for example, that if the player is transferred from club B to club C, club A shall have the right to receive 15% uh, of the amount. What about if the player? 
uh, is not sold on a permanent transfer but goes uh, on loan to another club for 1 million. Of course, the previous club will say you have to pay 15 million of 1 million, 15% of 1 million because there is a transfer, even though it's a loan, it's a technically a transfer, so you have to pay the 15% the of the buy, of the salon clothes. So the other club is likely to say no, because we were, we, we were uh, the intention was to make reference only to permanent transfer. So uh, according to the CAS jurisprudence, if nothing is said in the wording of the clause, it's only the transfer, not the loan, that trigger, uh, triggers the execution of the sell loan clause. So for uh, lawyers drafting contract, it's always advisable uh, to, um, to specify that this sell loan clause um, it applies not only for transfer but also for loan. There are other interesting cases where, for example, the transfer, the, the, uh, the loan was in reality a transfer. So it was a, uh, a simulated loan but uh, was in reality a transfer. So in that case, CAS recognized that uh, the sell loan clause applied because it was de facto a transfer. There is also another very interesting case, a case uh, between the locomotive and uh, the club Nika. Nika sold the player to locomotive. Uh, locomotive then um, send the, uh, sold the player on a permanent basis to another club, but for free. The club, uh, the the player, and the, the the new club terminated the, the the contract with the player, so the player became a free agent, but then signed again a new contract with Locomotive. So when after two years the player was sold for a significant amount of money, Nika said, so now you have to pay 15% uh, of the sell loan clause. And of course Locomotive said no, because you, your right had already extinguished after the first transfer that was for free. So in that case, CAS recognized that the first transfer, although was done on a permanent basis, was in reality a loan, was a simulated transfer, but was in reality a loan. Why? Because it was just six months, so they considered the short term of the contract and the fact that it was done for free. And the fact that then the player signed a new contract with the, with the club. Um, so another important uh, issue can be, um, what does it mean, uh, transfer fee? So is, for example, the compensation paid for the execution of a buy buyout clause uh, also uh, considered as technically as a transfer fee? So is the previous club entitled to get a percentage of the amount paid by the new club for the execution of the buyout clause. In the case, there is not a transfer, but uh, the buyout clause is, uh, is paid by the player. Uh, or, for example, in the case the player is sold to another club, I would say for free, but in exchange of another player. So in this case, it's better to, to define some uh, um, to, to, to make some, uh, to, to put some details in the, in, in the wording of the, the, the sell loan clause if we want that the sell loan clause is uh, triggered in case uh, of this kind of transfers. Uh, then how do we calculate this, uh, this percentage? Because actually you have to specify if this percentage is uh, on whatever transfer fee, so even if the future transfer fee is less than the transfer fee that the, play, the, the, the club paid for acquiring uh, the services of the player, or for example, if the percentage is only on the capital gain of the club in case of a future transfer. Usually these uh, kind of clauses are drafted in this second way, so by saying that uh, uh, the amount to be considered is the net amount, so considering the new transfer um, fee, uh, deducting all the costs that the, the, the club has incurred to, to acquire the services of the player. Sometimes also, for example, the commission for the intermediaries is uh, included in this kind of 
clauses. And also it's important to, um, to consider in some cases, for example, to, uh, the, the currency. Because, for example, if the player is transferred from Spain to Italy, of course uh, it's going to be Europe, but then the player can be uh, sold to, to the United States or to, to Russia, and then, of course, the payment is made in another currency. And due to the rate exchange um, fluctuation, of course, there might be uh, uh, some more convenient or less convenient uh, situation. So it's uh, also worth to 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 to, to make some um, to, to to put some details on this. Um, <coughs> so as I said before, um, the clubs are not affected by this uh, TPO ban. So this means that clubs are entitled to receive this percentage over the future transfer, even though, for example, the club is uh, owned by an agent or uh, investment fund. So actually, this is um, quite the trend since uh, TPO have been uh, abolished, have been banned. Uh, and this is uh, one of the, the, the key points also the reform of the transfer system because uh, one of the requirements for being an agent, an agent will be that the agent cannot, uh, share, uh, cannot have any share in football clubs and so on. Uh, so in principle these, uh, these clauses are um, uh, legitimate but if there is a certain influence of the, new, of the previous club on the new club, then the, the clause is not uh, is to be considered null and void because, in this case, uh, we take into consideration also Article 18 uh, B's, according which there cannot be any kind of influence uh, also from clubs regarding uh, employment and transfer related matters. So I've put some clauses. Uh, yes or no, if it's uh, in principle allowed or not, just uh, to have uh, an idea, but you can read. For me, it's difficult <laughs> to read from here. So, uh, loan transfer. So, Article 10 of FIFA regulation established some, some basic rules for uh, transfer, for uh, uh, temporary transfers. So, the minimum, the minimum loan period is, uh, shall be between the two registration periods. So. Um, a period which is less than this uh, period is not uh, allowed. Uh, the same rules as for transfer also apply to loans. So also, for example, training compensation and solidarity payment. Uh, sub loans are permitted according to the current FIFA regulation. So it means, for example, that if a, play, if, um, a club has loaned a player, then it can also uh, se uh, send the player on loan uh, to a third club, but it's important that um, the, he, got the he, got, he gets the written confirmation for, uh, from the parent club. And of course, the employment contract between the previous club and uh, the player is just suspended, so the, the previous club is not uh, obliged to, to, to pay uh, any salary because, of course, it will be the new, uh, the new club. Uh, even though, of course, the clubs may agree on a different on different terms. For example, they can share the the, the salary for for the player, or just this, the the uh, the the parent club pays the salary to to the club. So here I put some of the um, uh, most critical uh, clauses can be uh, included in a loan agreement. For example, the option or the right to purchase. In this case, it means that after the expiration of the loan, the new club is entitled to, uh, to buy the player. Sometimes there is a, uh, an obligation even to, to purchase the, the player. And actually, there is um, uh, an abuse, I would say, of this, uh, of this rule, especially uh, due to the requirements of financial fair play. So many clubs used to, um, to, to make a permanent transfer, but by saying that he's alone with uh, uh, a right uh, to, to purchase the, the player uh, the next year just for budgeting reason, just to report the payment of the transfer fee on the next season. So FIFA is very uh, careful with this kind of clause and uh, it doesn't care if uh, the, the, the agreement is a loan agreement but will be considered as a permanent one. 
And then, uh, in some cases, there are clauses prohibiting the player to play against the parent club. This was the case, for example, of the loan contract between Chelsea and Atletico de Madrid some years ago uh, regarding the player Courtois. Actually, um, the, the clause um, established that in case the two clubs were playing against each other, for example, in, uh, in European competition, then Courtois, um, uh, Atletico Madrid was not able to, uh, to fill the player unless Atletico were able to pay 3 million per, per match. So actually, uh, it was UEFA intervening at that, uh, that time by making a, uh, by issuing a circular saying that this kind of um, clauses are prohibited because it's not allowed to have uh, an influence over the um, policy of the other clubs. So these kind of clauses are not uh, advisable, uh, advisable, of course. Uh, there are some different uh, provisions, for example, in the Premier League regarding uh, loans. Uh, for example, there are some limits, how many players can be registered on loan in the same club and so on. And for example, sub loans are not uh, allowed in the Premier League. And these kind of measures are, like, uh, are likely to be also implemented at the international level if that package of reform uh, is approved. So the next step is the FIFA DMS. Uh, whenever there is an international transfer of players, the two clubs need to put uh, all the information related to the transfer in the FIFA DMS, that is an online system uh, in place since 2011. Uh, the, the information uh, in the uh, transfer in the TMS have to, to match, so the information put by uh, the, the selling club must be the same of the other club, otherwise the system doesn't go ahead and doesn't allow to request the ITC, that is uh, the most important uh, part of an international transfer because without the ITC the player cannot be registered in a new club. So this is a list of the information to be provided. I try to speed up because we are running out of time. Uh, so when there is the match of the information in the FIFA DMS, the transfer can be concluded. So the only thing that the, play, that the club has to do is to request the ITC. The request goes to the association, and the association makes the formal request to the, to the former one. So once the, new, the old association, the previous association, send the ITC, the transfer is, uh, is done. Of course, deal might fail because of the TMS because uh, they have not the clubs have not uh, included all the information and have not uploaded the relevant content in TMS on time uh, before the end of the transfer window before the closure of the deadline. So we remember some years ago it was uh, uh, the JEA, for example, was supposed to move, but then uh, even though the contract were signed and everything, the the contract were not. Uh, uh, upload on time on FIFA DMS. Another case that I'm very um, uh, keen to, 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 to mention every time is the case of Bergesio because actually this, this, is the re this case was the reason why I'm here today in the football industry speaking at this conference because actually it was after that case that Calcio Catania started looking for a lawyer <laughs> and uh, I was hired. So actually it was Bergesio moved from Saint-Étienne to Calcio Catania and the person who was in charge of FIFA DMS at that time at Calcio Catania wanted to scan the documents to upload the documents on the FIFA DMS but he had a problem with the scanner because it was in another room, the key was uh, I don't know where. So after midnight of course it was not possible to um, to put the to to include to, to upload the go the contract on the TMS and of course they were not able to release uh, the two to receive the ITC uh, because uh, we're uh, out of time. So uh, then there are um, many other cases. Uh, for example, this is a relevant one. I would suggest you to, <laughs> to ever read of this award because it's an interesting one bet between uh, Sporting and uh, uh, Nice d'Azur. Actually, the, uh, the transfer agreement between uh, um, the two clubs were subject to the issue of the ITC, uh, but it was the fault of the French club who couldn't upload all the contracts in time, so it did uh, after midnight, at midnight, one minute. Uh, so 
uh, they tried uh, to 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 to, um, uh, to get from FIFA an exception to the transfer rules, but of course the single judge of the player status committee rejected the request, so they went to CAS. CAS held the decision of the uh, FIFA player status committee uh, the, of the single judge. So actually, the uh, mm, the French club decided to terminate the contract with the player, and when uh, Sporting claimed for the transfer fee that was one million, they said no because actually the contract was subject, was condi uh, the, the, mm, the release of the ITC was one of the conditions for the validity of the contract. And since we haven't received the ITC, the ITC has not been uh, issued, the contract was not, uh, didn't enter into force. So uh, Sporting of course went to CAS and uh, CAS considered that ah, the, the interesting side of the story is that the player then was a free agent because the club terminated the contract and signed as a free agent for, uh, um, for Benfica, so a rival of Sporting. So Sporting didn't get any amount and on top of that the player was hired by a rival. So uh, actually CAS decided that um, uh, the French club had to pay damages equal to 1 million that was the, the transfer fee. So uh, in the Premier League the previous club doesn't have to put any information because he doesn't have any relation with the, with the player anymore. So this is uh, just uh, an example of what, how um, the, um, the international transfer certificate, the ITC, looks like. Uh, I won't go into the details of the other cases because uh, otherwise we need uh, two hours more. Then the registration is uh, really the final stage. is done by the FA or by the league, depends from country to country. Uh, sometimes, of course, the league, the federation, can reject the registration of a player because there is, uh, for example, um, uh, uh, the, the, there is no compliance with some regulation. For example, uh, I remember a case some years ago, uh, Pedro Leon uh, was not, the, the registration of Pedro Leon with the uh, Hetafe was rejected by La Liga because Hetafe was uh, not complying with financial fair play regulation. Actually, the, the, uh, there is a kind of um, cap wages, uh, wages cap on, um, and, and so uh, with this transfer they were taking over the cap. So that was uh, the reason why. So uh, in uh, the Premier League, for example, the system that they use for registration is similar to TMS, but is of course on a national. Uh, basis, so this is how it looks like. Uh, the, an interesting um, thing to notice is that in the Premier League there is a kind of tax to be paid every time a, a player is transferred on is transfer on a national basis. There is a kind of levy of four percent. Uh, then intermediary, since uh, uh, the FIFA is going to, to change the rules, we don't spend any time uh, talking about this because perhaps in two months. Uh, it doesn't matter anymore. There will be new rules, training compensation and solidarity mechanism. Uh, okay, I think we are really running out of time, so I have to go really fast. Um, okay, the, 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 the interesting part of this presentation concerns also the MLS, because we are not very familiar with how the system works in the MLS. Uh, um, at least I was not even uh, aware some years ago when for the first time I was involved in the, uh, in the transaction of Jovinko went from, to, from uh, Juventus to, to Toronto. So of course when, an when an, a transfer has an international dimension, for example a player from Juventus or from Chelsea, from whatever, moves to an MLS club, the FIFA regulation applies, normal. Even though there are some um, uh, rules when it comes, for example, to the amount, to the, the, the transfer fee that is, uh, doesn't go directly to the club, actually a certain amount, a certain percentage is retained by the, uh, one third of the transfer fee is retained by the MLS. Um, but in principle, it's the same, the same rules apply. Uh, when the player, of course, is uh, moved, moves from two clubs uh, in the MLS, uh, moving between two clubs in the MLS, of course the MLS rule, uh, rules apply. And it's quite a different system from the one we are uh, familiar with, because actually in the MLS there is not the concept of the transfer fee. 
there is a very interesting statement of Don Gaber, the commissioner of the MLS. They said, he said, the MLS was founded on the principle that our owners will not be competing against each other for the player services. There will not be internal bidding for, uh, bidding for a player services. So actually, in order to understand this, we have to understand how the MLS is structured. It's a single, enti a single entity uh, where all the owners of the the clubs are in reality the owners of the MLS in its entirety, and they have, um, they are in charge of running a single foot, uh, soccer club, but actually they are shareholder of the MLS. So, and the MLS uh, control all the, the, the transfer between the clubs. The MLS signed the contract, so in the MLS you will not, will never see a contract signed between a player and this club, but between the, the player and the MLS. And it's the MLS who decide uh, about the player. And the most interesting uh, thing in this case is that in the MLS can decide despite the consent of the player. So if a player is uh, playing in uh, LA Galaxy and the MLS decide that has to go somewhere else, the player is uh, somehow obliged to uh, to move with his family and to, to, to change his life. So um, the, uh, how the, um, the, the transfer uh, work in the MLS? There are so many rules, so many mechanisms that I was getting crazy when I was trying to understand how the system works. And actually I called a person who was at that time working in the MLS, trying to understand better and was not even able to to explain because we're still trying to understand some rules. So I want, uh, of course, explain all these rules. You can find them on the MLS uh, website, but good luck because it's quite <laughs> <laughs> complicated. So, but for example, uh, one that um, was a very interesting one was the discovery process because each uh, club has the possibility to include in the discovery list seven players. Uh, what is the discovery list? They just um, decide seven players that are out of the MLS and they put them on the list. Even though they are not very interested in acquiring the services of the player, but they acquire a kind of priority when buying that player. So actually, for example, there was a problem with uh, Noserino when he wanted to move to, um, it was, uh, to Orlando because he wanted to join Kaká at that time he was there. So, Actually, Orlando wanted to uh, hire Noserino, but then discovered that Noserino was in the discovery list of DC United. So DC United said, no, it's my, on my discovery list, so you, you cannot hire this player. So well, actually, I don't think that DC United was really interested in Noserino, he just put <laughs> the player there. So the rule is that whenever a club has on his uh, uh, discovery list a, a player, then the other club has to pay a kind of compensation in order to get the player. So uh, uh, in the, the club had to pay $15,000 uh, in order to get this. And actually, I remember when uh, we made the, the negotiation for, uh, uh, for Jovinko, Jovinko was in the discovery list of, uh, of Toronto, but was just the idea of his agent going to speak with Toronto, saying, you know, I have this player, he's a, a free agent because his uh, country is about to expire, so I would like to propose the player. They said, you know, this player is on our discovery list, so it's perfect. But was just, uh, there was no real intention or real plan to, to, to hire the player. Um, so there are very uh, interesting rules. The, the most important one, perhaps, is the designated player because as you know, in the MLS, there is a salary cap. A salary cap on individual players, that is, uh, now we will uh, see it here, okay, uh, 500,000 uh, for, for players, so cannot be more than 500. But there is also a total salary budget for the club. So the club cannot spend more than 4 million uh, for, uh, for the squad. Of course, this means that if there are players earning 500,000, uh, uh, then there are players that uh, have to earn 50,000 because of course uh, there is uh, the, the total salary cap to be, uh, to be respected. And of course the reason why they apply these rules is to create competitive balance 
we have heard uh, yesterday uh, Agnelli talking about competitive balance and then my boss, Georg Pangol. So actually the MLS is a system uh, that is uh, an example to follow when it comes to competitive balance because all these uh, measures make the system quite, uh, um, quite uh, balanced. So I was referring to the, uh, to the difference in salaries uh, between players. So this was uh, just the sheet that I got from the MLS uh, uh, website, so it's nothing confidential. You can find it also if you if you go on the website of the MLS. So if you see, for example, Jovinko is earning seven po seven million, something like that, and then there are players who are earning just fifty thousand. So the 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 difference is uh, quite high. So the designated player rule allow a club to uh, hire two or up to three players uh, out, out of the uh, salary budget. So the salary budget, uh, the, the, the cap on salary, doesn't apply for these players. Actually, this rule was entered in, into force, was created when uh, um, uh, Beckham uh, was supposed to join uh, LA Galaxy, and there was a problem, of course, <laughs> with uh, the, the, the salary budget. Um, and that's why the rule was created and thanks to this rule now a lot of European uh, players are uh, moving to the MLS in order uh, to, to, to play there. And I can tell you that it's uh, quite an interesting market so for those who are, uh, uh, perhaps there are people who are still looking for, for a job in football or in soccer, keep an eye on uh, that market because I'm pretty sure that uh, in the future uh, it will uh, increase uh, a lot. Um, so, I was saying before that the, there is a specific rule when it comes to uh, the transfer fee that is paid, for example, by foreign clubs, because as we said, there are no transfer fee uh, between the clubs uh, at domestic level, between the MLS rules. Uh, but when a transfer fee is paid, by a foreign club, for example, uh, an Italian club is interested in buying a player from the MLS and is uh, willing to pay 10 million to the MLS play, uh, club. The 10 million doesn't go to, to the club, actually only two thirds goes to the, to the club, but the one third of this amount is retained by the MLS. And in any case, the two thirds goes to the, um, to the to the club, uh, the club cannot spend this amount as they wish. So they cannot say, no, we, we, uh, we buy Ronaldo <laughs> with this amount. No, because they have to, uh, to spend that amount of money based on the guidelines given by the MLS. So, <coughs> uh, as I said before, there is a, um, uh, a particular structure also of the agreement, the employment agreement, because it's an agreement between the MLS and the club and the player, not uh, uh, with the club, with the with the with the club, and there are also specific uh, and interesting uh, clauses uh, rules regarding loans, for example. Uh, for example, a parent club that has loan out a player can recall the player at any time during the season. Uh, there is a prohibition that is established by the MLS regulation for the player that is on loan to play against his parent club. So it was exactly the same example that we did before with Courtois, but in that case, in the MLS, this would be the rule. So could not be uh, the other way around. And yeah, and in any case, uh, if, for example, the club, uh, if the player wants to move on the, or the Okay, the, the club is interested to, uh, to, to give the player on loan to another club outside the MLS, is in any case the MLS who has discre uh, discretion in, uh, uh, in order for the, the player to be loaned out in another uh, football club outside the MLS. So uh, there are some uh, other interesting rules, for example, when it comes to the, uh, to the period, of, to the length of the contract. So there are also uh, very short term agreements, up to four days, for example, for, for players to be able to, um, to, to, for the club to be able to sign players just for, uh, for some matches, for example, uh, for the CONCACAF Champions League, for example. 
then a player can be removed by the uh, by the Premier by the, the, the MLS or by the, the club in this case based on performance this would be impossible uh, in, in Europe I mean would be really impossible and then um, as I said before player can be moved from one club to another without his consent so and then the free agent is quite a, a, a very sp different uh, concept so there are no free agents in the MLS system but since 2015 I guess this concept has been established uh, so actually now free agents are those players who have who have an experience of at least eight years in the MLS and are older than 28 years old. So it's a completely uh, a system, uh, it's a completely different system compared to the FIFA system that we are uh, familiar with. Uh, I'm not saying that it's uh, worse, <laughs> but uh, it's different. So we are already out of the uh, time uh, shot allowed. So thank you very much. I hope it was Thank uh, you very much, Ornella. It was a brilliant presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Big applause for her. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, so you can address questions uh, during the break. We will have five minutes and we continue with Reyes Belver and transfer of minors. Thank you very much. In any case, uh, oh, there is no. Oh, yeah, there is my email uh, address here and also my uh, account on Twitter because it's much better to send a message on Twitter because my email account is always a disaster so I <laughs> hardly reply. <laughs>